honestly speaking, that's a, that's a very good question. What do you need to give? There's so much you need to give back. The first thing you cannot give is life, which you've taken, which you've robbed people of, their parents, their families, their kids. You can't return those things. You know, one thing about us, we were always taught from where we come from, Kata Manor, products of false removal, that if somebody came at your door and knocked, my mother would say, well, I'm taking your meal and sharing it. It happened when we moved into Wendu, it was all about sharing, and people would see that. We had Ubuntu, not only our family, but everybody that came in. It's a different community altogether. And if you look at this community, it's a giving community. There's always somebody feeding somebody any other day. My dad applied for a house in Wentworth and it was during the apartheid times and there was an Afrikaner guy that came through and said, no, 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 to the guy, this is the wrong thing what you're doing. The husband is Cape Malay, the mom is Indian. Cape Malays belong in Wentworth because they are classified colours. And that's how we ended up in Wentworth in 1969. There was little to be done in 1970s, I would say. <laughs> uh, basically, it would just be a trip to town, do your shopping, get back, and the kids were all in the road and everyone was playing, and parents are Brian, parents are sitting out, having time together, talking, chilling. That was really what happens around there. The area was industrialized in 1931 by the then British Council. And what they done is, is develop the industry and people were moved out of this area. So quite a number over the, the next 50 years, people that were originally here from the land and on the land, the Zanzibaris, the indentured labor, communities from the Eastern Cape that came here and other communities involved, they were moved out on the pretext that it's going to create jobs for them. And then they started to bring people in from different areas, force them out of other areas where they were keen running water, the land was clean, people were planting food and providing for the family. The fish in the rivers was huge. I grew up on that, you know. And brought people in here and placed them next to dirty industries, not telling them it's dirty, saying, well, this is going to be job creation. And it was, you know, huge industries in the area, and so it was something different. But what we also witnessed and what we experienced was that suddenly we had to pay. Whereas where we came from, we never paid for water, we never paid for electricity, we had our own electricity that we made. We could walk to the harbour, we could go to the river and fish, uh, we could get food out of, off our grounds, we had a huge amount of land. And then over the years we realised, hold on, but what we were missing. My dad's lungs collapsed. He couldn't work any longer and we were at the hospital. And I can recall that incident when he was coughing and he was choking and I heard the doctor say to my mom, his lungs has collapsed. And it just was downhill after that. Then the heart was taking a toll and then he had a heart attack. So that was like continuously happening month after month. Every month he'd be in the hospital. And we actually had to buy him oxygen tanks have it permanently on our premises at home so he can breathe. We had a lot of neighbours across our road. I think it was Mr. Kenny was constantly sick, constantly um, breathing problems and having oxygen tanks. And a lot of people in the area that you know of, it was always a cough or a choking or, or a heart or a lung. Not your basic, oh, you know what, I got flu, and no, 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 it was those severe type of uh, uh, conditions. 
you know, and you'd hear of a little boy that I was in school with, he was in the same grade as me, and he passed away with leukemia. And he was like about 16 when he passed away. We were devastated. He was 16 years old, fit as a fiddle, nothing wrong with him. And he passed away with leukemia. He was 16. Work started in the early 2000s and really started with a single school, the Settlers Primary School. And there was this incident where large numbers of children were collapsing and it was attributed to the elevated levels of pollution in the area. Now Settlers Primary was a very interesting primary school. If you stand out in the playing fields of that school, and if you look in one direction, you see the smokestacks of the engine refinery. If you turn around directly opposite, behind you, you see the smokestacks of the SAPREF refinery. So clearly, depending on which direction the wind blew on a particular day, that school was always in the middle of it. We know of the people that were dying through cancer, prostate cancer, many of the men that were working in the refineries have died of prostate cancer. Well, how do we understand this thing of the chemicals that are being emitted at the refinery? How do we understand the chemicals that we are breathing in? So we started to do our own air sampling in 2001 when we started with the bucket. That told us that we could measure for 60 chemicals and we could send it to a accredited laboratory that would show the different chemicals that people were breathing at that time, even though it was a grab sample. It proved very helpful. So when we embarked on this initiative of the environmental movement, we already knew that workers were getting blacklisted. There were huge fights. People were getting injured and they were kicked off the refineries. They weren't enjoying any benefits. There was no long-term employment opportunities. There wasn't any medical aid for those that were casual workers. And up until today, they're still casual. We had activists from Durban that were fighting the refineries for many years and we had spent many years in jail on Robben Island. Some of them were on death row. So we always knew that, they, that our people had always stood up and fought. Uh, and the refineries were never going to be there permanently. We knew from the beginning that they weren't employing our people. They were treating our people worse than slaves. After about 10 years, my mom and them were there 23 years, around to the 15 years, people started to get fed up because they're starting to see people get sick and people getting ill. So, hey, this is like a wake up call. We need to do something. The communities were, were having community meetings. They would have neighborhood meetings. You would still think you have to deal with the neighborhood watch with the gangsters. That wasn't really the problem. The neighborhood watch was for, you know, the orgy findry. Our young people are suffering worse off than ever before. They, not only do they get, there's a double dose of asthma, of all the pollution and all the asthma and cancer and leukemia, but also they don't get jobs and they don't get money to study further. And engine doesn't have a thing of employment of, uh, you know, engineers, budding engineers from the community. In fact, they don't employ our skilled people yet because they know through the medical uh, assessments that they do that already our people are affected with their health. So why would you employ them at your refinery, knowing fully well? So it's always about employing people from outside the community and not inside the community. What then tends to happen is that these children then start to miss school. And because they're missing school, they're gonna perform badly at school and therefore reduce their uh, ability to get a good education and 
get good jobs. If that child is repeatedly sick, one of the parents has got to take time off work to take the child for healthcare. Means you have to get in early, stand in long, long queues, and you've wasted an entire working day. So their income is reduced because of this. In these low socioeconomic communities where your income is marginal already, a large amount of your income is going to address the healthcare needs of this affected child. Now, if that limited income is going to support the health care of this child, the other children who may not be affected by the pollution are being affected because they're not getting one, adequate attention, or two, adequate meals, because people have to make very critical decisions about how you utilize your marginal income. So the, the impact of pollution on the health is not just on the individual, it's just not the direct, there's a multiple indirect costs. It basically means they're not ever able to escape out of the spiral from this affected and polluted community. The sense of hopelessness I think comes in when a person is unemployed and those frustrations obviously get carried out and are seen visibly within the community through the abuse of substance and physical violence and, and manipulation within your own personal relations. And I think if we have to address the issue around gender-based violence and femicide, then we need to look at providing equal opportunity to increase the socioeconomic status of the community. I was approached by three boys for a five bob, which is like a colloquial language within this community for like a 50 cents. I was 16 then, um, the boys were probably like in their late 20s. And um, I said, I don't have. And I continued to walk the path towards the school. And um, two of the three boys um, then um, attacked me. The community was quite great in terms of supporting. I was found at the graveyard by this woman um, who I've now got to know since the incident as Auntie Maureen. And she hunted my family down and brought me back home. I was in a state of unconsciousness. And as we were coming down the pathway through the park, all the gangs on the corner and stuff like that, everybody like ran because I was full of blood. Hey, what happened, what happened, what happened? And Auntie Maureen's trying to explain to them. And everybody from here rallied up, went on a manhunt and found the guys, beat them up and took them to the police station themselves. Because when I had got to the police station to report the crime, the police were not helpful at all. And you go to South Durban and you will ask them, a lot of the people have been staying there for three, four generations. And that's because they're not able to step out. In any other setting, we know that as the next generation, parents build the children up so that they can move up into the next level, so they can escape that, that poverty cycle. But they're not able to do that in the South Durban community. I think the main struggle for me is that people are thinking about the immediate, like to put food on the table, and not the long-term consequences that these refineries pose on them. So it's a scramble for resources, it's a scramble to survive. It's, yeah, it's a mechanism of survival. So not to say that they don't understand, but there's a minimum understanding. And for them, it's like the long-term effect is not as immediate or important to them for now, because they're just trying to get through the day. A lot of people in Wentworth let things slide because they take it as, you know what, it's one of those things, I've got this house for free, I didn't pay for it, the government gave it to me, I unfortunately have to accept them putting me in these conditions and because I'm maybe, uh, we, we're not financially secure, we have to just accept it, where are we going to go from there? There's nowhere to go. 
inhale this, take it. It couldn't be that bad. It won't affect you that bad. But when you start seeing family members falling down and you realize, hey, they're falling down because of lung infections, lung this, then you, it's, it's like a wake up call to say, you know what, don't let it slide. But most people in the area let it slide. You've got to have money to get a lawyer. You've got to have a money to prove it. So they just let it be, you know. When you go to the hospitals in the area, they don't have chronic medication. Sometimes people can't get there at night because there's no transport working 20 hours in our community. If you go to hospital and clinics, you get Panado for a chronic medication of asthma. When you're struggling to breathe, you're getting a Panado syrup or Panado tablet. If they do invest in clinics and hospitals, they put up a TV, a screen, so you can watch health uh, programs. But they do not hold themselves accountable for the health problems of the area. And they realize that they, if they have to put into medical for the people, that they are admitting to the guilt. One of the things that we identified was that although children generally both in the North and the South, were affected by the pollution, that the children in the South had much more asthma than the children in the North. We hypothesize that it is possible that there's something happening that genetically reshapes the children such that they become more susceptible to develop asthma. Because historically we know that asthma is a, a genetics-based disease. So, although pollution may make your, your symptoms worse, the case for saying that pollution causes asthma is not as strong. So why would South Durban children have higher levels of asthma as compared to the North? So it seems likely that the pollutants, what we refer to as causing an epigenetic change over a shorter period of time, within generations, and that this may be pollutant related. So it then suggested to us that these children are definitely at greater risk for developing some of these outcomes. That it is still likely the next generation or two will still be carrying some of the pollutant related burden going into the future. We don't want these big corporations running away from the country and all that. We want them to be held accountable for people's health and also to be held accountable for the, the workers. I think it's very important to note that a lot of the companies that we are referring to have very strong international connections. And in lots of instances, they're headquartered internationally. We have seen historically that some of the approaches that they would take are different from the standards they would adopt in South Africa or in poorer countries. We have also seen instances where companies move away from places like Europe and North America and relocate to countries like South Africa and other poorer countries because it's easier and the environmental legislative framework allows them to function. I would say, personally, the oil refinery should have been shut down a long time ago and it should have been placed in an isolated place where there were no humans around, not even animals, because animals don't deserve that as well. As much as we say isolated and keep it separate to the humans and the animals, the environment is going to suffer. There must be a way to resolve that matter and people should have thought before you just put human beings around chemical factories and the decent thing would have been to disclose what you're doing because you're affecting people. The oil refineries rob them a lot of their, their livelihoods and their families and their loved ones. And to find a way to resolve that, it's rather late, but go back and see what you've done to the people and rectify it. Do a compensation towards them, you know. But money doesn't save it at the end of the day. We do need to get to a fossil-free kind of energy mix. But when we speak about that, we need to look at how um, are we going to upskill, reskill, and kind of transition people into this new energy mix. 
I think the way that I unpacked in my mind is that the Reds and the Greens need to get together and actually pave this way forward because ideally who would be impacted on the workers and the community. We are saying withdraw the money, put it into projects that will improve the townships, the suburbs, where the poor are living. Let's develop a renewable sector in our communities and an industry that people benefit and own.